So, um, hi everyone. Uh, I'm Neil Peace. Um, that's me. I work at uh, UM London. I uh, have done for six years now. Um, and um, I'm from the UK. Uh, I'm from Newcastle, for those who know the UK. Um, for those who don't, it's where Newcastle Brown Ale comes from. Um, so. Uh, what, I, what this means is, it doesn't mean I've had a Newcastle Brown Ale before I come on stage, but it does mean that I often talk very quickly, so I'll try and slow it down a little bit for everyone in the room. And I'm Saki Mosuf. I work for Cadreon IPG at Type Partners for UM, and uh, my accent's more like Bollywood villain, so I will, we'll, we'll work it out together. <laughs> so it's a battle of accents. Yes. Cool, but we're not here to talk about accents. Uh, so we're here to talk about our work on The Economist. Um, for those who don't know The Economist, um, it's a, a very old newspaper founded in uh, 1843. Um, it's British based, but it's global in its outlook. So it, it will uh, talk about APAC, US, global affairs, truly kind of dynamic uh, changes across the, across the world. Um, it has a liberal focus. So, um, you know, it will talk about pushing agenda, equal rights, um, you know, same sex marriage, this sort of thing. Um, it's published weekly, um, and it has print and digital formats across apps, tablets, and um, online. Um, it's currently at around 1.6 million circulation, and their revenue model is part ad-funded and part subscription-funded. And there are a lot of factors and forces at play within the publishing world, which make it quite a difficult place to be right now. Um, First thing is, uh, ad revenues are falling, um, so print circulations are slightly down. Um, but also, increasingly, it's very difficult to monetize your content if you're a publisher. Um, lots of reasons behind that. Um, one of them is the kind of rise of these big social players. Uh, increasingly, people are consuming content in these walled gardens, which I'm sure we're all aware of. Um, so, you know, the economist strategy is. Uh, to kind of play in these spaces, to make sure that their content is findable wherever the audience is. Um, the other kind of major factor between ad revenues falling, which is an increasing issue, is um, ad blocking and ad avoidance, which um, obviously we're all trying to work out ways around. And then finally, um, you know, in the face of that, actually what we could see through pre-research is that actually there was a massive opportunity for The Economist because um, their audience is one that we define as progressive. They are, um, you know, liberally minded, um, very much globally minded. Uh, we identified that there was a massive opportunity in market, 73 million um, across the globe. So there was a huge growth, uh, sorry, a huge opportunity for growth within the subscription side of their business. However, we had to challenge brand perceptions. So those of you who haven't heard of The Economist might have an opinion a bit like William. And William basically thinks that anybody who uh, would like The Economist is probably a banker. Um, and he, you know, he, he's probably just going to use this information to get richer, right? Which he could do, but that's not what The Economist is just about. So we had a perception problem. But actually, what people didn't know is that we had some awesome content. So the content wasn't what you would expect either. You know, we, we look at econo economic forecasts with the Big Mac Index. Uh, we look at legalizing prostitution um, and equal rights, and we look at gun crime in America. Um, so we deal with some really big issues outside of just financial. So th that kind of posed a problem for us because we knew progressives were out there. Apparently, there were 73 million of them. But trying to find a psychographic or trying to target a psychographic is, is very difficult. You know. You know, it, you couldn't be defined by a demographic or your geolocation or your gender. So the usual data points just weren't going to cut it for us. But what we did identify is that we had a really, really strong uh, data set at home within the Economist Zone DMP. So we can talk about TMS, CMS, DMPs, all that stuff. But in, in essence, you know, you want to make the content 
work in context. You want the media and the site to work together. There's a lot of plumbing that goes in. I'm not going to bore you with that, but there is a lot of work. We're, we're at a point in the industry where the human involvement is still there. It has to be there. You all know what happened with the Microsoft tweet bot. So it's, it's very important when you work with content, to, that's where the agencies come in and we make sure we can group the words together, send them to the programmatic media back and forth. Cool. So what we did was we actually used a really unique blend of data in which to identify those progressives. So we looked at the highest value subscribers within our app ecosystem, um, those people who you know, had been subscribing for the longest time, um, who were super users, who would take all of our products. We then started to segment them, and why that was important was because we wanted to be able to deliver them content that would be uh, that they would be receptive to. So the guys who were interested in politics would receive politics articles. The guys who were interested in finance or uh, liberal causes would receive, you know, a banking article, or would receive an article about the legalization of prostitution, whatever that might be. We then used our data partners in order to enrich that data set to make it scalable. And then finally, using our um, trading cloud, we put PMPs and deals in place with the publishers that we knew uh, we needed on side in order to find those users in the right place. And then we kind of thought a little bit harder and thought, well, what else can we do? You know, we, we know we can hit the audience. We know we can give them the right content. But what else, like, what, what else about them? What, what were their user journeys before that? So we started to look at, you know, had they already received content? What was that content? We started to look at which audience segment they fell into. But then we thought, well, what if, what if we could do something about the ad that was on the page? So we looked into the context of where we would serve. So what we did was for the first ever time, we put together um, a kind of list of um, technology partners and built a, a bespoke technology stack uh, with the dynamic ad server, with our creative agency working in tour, with a contextual page mapping service, and with a DSP. And what that allowed us to do was we were able to use technology to scan the page that we were about to serve in, scan the client's page uh, that the article would ultimately come from, and then make the best match and serve an ad, uh, or build an ad out of the most relevant article to the page that we were serving on. And that's where we saw some really awesome results. For instance, Yeah, as you can see, there were some kind of staggering results out of this. And whilst it, you know, it took a lot of work, um, it was ultimately worth it. And we you know, saw some brilliant results. Um, we then used the same dynamic ad server to make decisions based on which retargeting or which offer you would be retargeted with. Because ultimately, once we'd served the content, we wanted to retarget down to subscription. And looking at results, we absolutely smashed our targets. So you know, we saw eight times the uh, amount of prospects, new prospects that would be addressable and retargetable to their business. And the amount of subscriptions that we delivered uh, was uh, plus 36% on first, first touch, first click, and uh, attributed plus 52% overall 88% lift. So staggering. Um, and what's more, you know, for those that people that say programmatic is just about DR, it's not. It moves brand metrics as well. Um, you know, significant rises in all the kind of key things that we were looking for. Expert, uh, the, the, economist was, the economist was seen as expert, international, trustworthy, all the right things. So I think for us, what's really special about this campaign is actually its simplicity. In an age where I mentioned of ad blocking, um, all of these ads are GIFs. They're very light. They, you know, the, you look at the IAB guidelines of being lean. That's what they are. They're, in, they're basically right message, right time, in right place. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Jerry, do you have any questions?
We got two. First question. whether they were one-time users, whether they came back, subscribed, et cetera, et cetera. Um, yeah, we, we did. So I think at first, the target from the client was purely on prospects. But I think we, we saw that we could do a little bit more than that and then looked at the quality of those prospects. And ultimately, you know, we could track um, the user right down to subscription. Um, but then we looked to an attribution partner, VIQ, which then started to tell us a bigger story about um, you know, what the value of the impression was that we were landing when we were doing it in the right context, in the right place. Um, so, yeah, so I think we, we started to look at the quality far more. And actually, the quality of those, you know, it, it was backing out. The, the, you know, there was another agency doing some of the retargeting. They could see the quality of those prospects and were, you know, feeding it directly into us. So it didn't just end at landing. Other question? Yeah. S sorry if you mentioned that. Uh, just... Uh, were you able to do the same job uh, through the browsing and the application regarding the scan of the page and, and the way you, you had served? So sorry, just say the question again. When we were looking at the application and scanning no. the page. Were you able to do the same thing when you are in browsing or in app? Or did you, did you face any issue regarding the application? Yeah, so we, the technology didn't uh, had a barrier within apps, so it would work on mobile web, it would work on um, on desktop, obviously, but within app, um, we relied much more on the kind of segments and the lookalike segments that we built up front. We didn't quite have that ability to kind of figure out what was what the content was in an app because it's just not in the same language. It's, it can't be read. Yeah, I mean, the, so most of the data we were collecting was coming from desktop cookies and working on the main dot com site. So the site and the media were mostly on the site. Thank you. Let's give them a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you.